So that's uh, that's it, Jill. Take it away. Awesome, great. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. I hope everybody is having a great conference. I know I've been uh, super inspired and it's been great to hear the presentations and reconnect uh, with some old friends. Uh, we are gonna be talking in today's session about culture change and employee engagement. And we have um, some really interesting stories from people that have been out there doing that in the field. Our first uh, presenter will be Bruce Bucken. Bruce is the founder and CEO of Clean River Recycling Solutions. Clean River has been involved in the sustainability industry for 30 plus years, ranging from consulting to zero waste audits and has been manufacturing recycling centers made from recycled content for the past 20 years. I think he just sold my screen. I've got some slides uh, that I was gonna use to uh, uh, to share with you all. Uh, but after Bruce, uh, we're going to hear from Camille Sawinski and Barbara Larson from BCK Programs. BCK Programs has implemented environmental education programs throughout San Diego County, in Orange County, and in Hawaii and Nevada. Uh, BCK has a secret sauce that applies to any organization. Camille is one of the founding partners, and Barbara is an environmental educator uh, with her boots on the ground. Uh, after that, we're going to hear from Daniel Sanchez with Elika Avante. Daniel is a zero waste and circular economy entrepreneur, and he's going to share with us how technology and data helps culture change become part of your business processes. After we hear from each speaker, we are going to be taking questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please, as the questions come up, feel free to post those in the chat. If you could, um, sometimes the chat gets kind of busy. We encourage you to use it to discuss amongst yourselves and to connect. But if you do have a question for the presenter, um, if you could proceed uh, the question with the queue, and if it's not clear you know, who the question is uh, to, uh, we will uh, feed those to the presenters and take them after the presentations today. Uh, with that, Bruce, you can go ahead and get your screen set up now. I didn't... Uh, and share that. And we will get going. Okay, thank you, Jill. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> Terrific. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you to the uh, Zero Waste USA for the opportunity to share some experiences here today on this webinar. So the presentation I'm speaking about today, let's see if it'll forward. Uh, seeming to having a, oh, here it is. The presentation today is creating a culture of empowerment around your zero waste management program. And over the years, I've learned that culture means many things to many people. And my goal here today is for everyone present to take a, at least get one to two key takeaways that they can implement at their own organization that can truly make a difference. So to begin, I'd like to talk about the current state. And with that, this is what I have learned throughout my organization over three decades. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is the recycling program evolution. For many people starting, it would uh, start off with a collection where they would simply buy some recycling containers and they would capture the low hanging fruit like paper, aluminum cans, and the diversion would go up, but then it would plateau and sort of fall off for many different reasons. And then the next phase is the communication. And this could be kicked in by, you know, maybe a demand in markets or regulations. And this is not about putting a label on a bin. It's about communication, transparency, and getting people involved. And what we have seen is that would take it up to the next level, which could be 40, 50, 60%. And then traditionally it falls off. And what we've learned is the environmental stewards out there, they understand the impact that culture can have on an organization to take it even higher. But the reality is what we've also known over the years is it's always about the money 99% of the time. And this is what we've seen in face. And it's been a big detractor of recycling and zero waste initiatives over the years. So in working with zero waste, we believe the zero waste approach requires a different approach. And to go from the traditional three R's, the reduce, reuse, recycle, 
we created a concept called the three C's, which is culture, communication, and collection. And here's a little bit what's involved. Culture, as I mentioned, it means many things to many people, but it really is the key, having leadership buy in, put their stake in the ground, and also spills down into the innovation, the transparency about telling you know, what you're actually doing rather than putting something at the end of an annual report that says we've diverted 100 million tons of something. But also getting people involved and it relates right into the end, you know, the extended producer policy because what we've seen a lot of times is the flavor of the month. You know, it's Earth Week and let's, we're gonna really make a difference and then it falls flat. But a lot of times I'll ask people about the culture in their own organization. And, it, you know, we've, act, we've termed that term cave people and that is citizens against virtually everyone. And we know who they are, they're out there. <clears throat> but I ask a lot of people, you gotta do a check. How's the culture in your own organization? But it's not just culture, it's also the communication. And this is, of course, you wanna get a green team, you wanna get the senior management goals and measuring things because what gets measured gets done, which involves accuracy of the streams. And again, the communication, some people will have waste bins and convert them to recycling. And sometimes the recycling bins look like they should be recycled themselves. So what does that really convey by the senior management saying, well, we really don't care. And to finish it off with communication, you must keep people updated. And this involves sharing best practices and continuous education. And then there's the third C in the collection. Culture touches every part of this, and that's the flow of materials. We all have the same issue, materials from flowing from the front of the house to the back of the house, which involves hauler contracts, opportunities on the volume and frequency and amounts they're picking up. And really, you know, is it a very nice office you're in or is it a, uh, you know, a rubber tire manufacturing plant? Different requirements, because sometimes people will just take the path of least resistance and, uh, Take a 45 gallon drum slap a recycling label and we call that putting lipstick on a pig. And the collection also involves a lot more detailed concepts such as color coordination and never forget about the servicing of the equipment. Just because you're purchasing it, does the culture in your organization take into fact that custodial have to play an important role? And again, in these ever changing times, future ready, things will change. So I ask everyone out there, Pardon me, just going, let me just back it up one second here. <clears throat> so the future state, as we say, going into the zero waste, which is 80% and above, what does that look like? What I've learned is we actually have it backwards. And that is, if you started with the culture, everything else would be so much easier because with a, a, a well-oiled culture, Culture makes the communication process easier and communication then makes the collection process easier. And it's my belief, if you have a button down culture and everybody's bought in, you could simply give them a shoebox and they would know how to do the right thing. So is culture a factor? Yes, and I'd say that absolutely yes. And it's also been said by many people that culture eats strategy for breakfast and I'm a firm believer on that. So how does culture impact your organization? Does it impact the brand, cultural, social, financial? And you'll see on the left there, you know, the greenwash, we've all heard that term, guaranteed to cover over all of your environmental cracks and make you look good. So let's just talk about cultural impact on the brand. Years ago, and I'll go back 30 years, when we were hiring people, we had all the power. We would get their resume. And we could look through and see exactly where they've been, what they've done, and they could find out very little about us. But that has shifted so dramatically these days that when people are looking to seek employment or even going, choosing a university or a college, they have all the power to do the researching. And I've had this conversation with a lot of people. If your organization has had a serious issue with sustainability uh, fines or problems and you're in the news, Perhaps the culture that's driving your organization is causing you to lose out in top talent as an employer and also as a university. And we've also done a lot of understanding on millennials where the traditional world of brand, you know, protection, you know, like you think of the Cokes, the Nikes, the Apples, 
protect the brand well to a lot of people brand is themselves what are you going to do for me and this is really taking a big position out there as people you know consider culture in the workplace but let's talk about social impact for a second uh, years ago i had the pleasure of having you know lunch with my daughter and her friend at a quick serve restaurant and once we we're all finished they went over to the container and you could see where there's a recycling of trash section they put it in and then because of the the business i'm involved in they opened up to take a look and what was happening and i'm sure many of you have seen this before everything was going into the same bin and that just screams of greenwashing so they took a picture of it and i can tell you one thing out there these days with social media People will love you for trying, but absolutely hate you for lying. And you know the power of taking a picture and hitting a button. So even if, you know, my daughter said, I'm never going back and had a sandwich for $5 a week, you just think about the total and then multiply it. But let's take it a step further on the financial impact. When Whole Foods, you know, with it was, they were found to be uh, mislabeling some of the products, this message came out. And you can see there, there was, the power of social media, and this was the first day it came out, there was 12,000 shares. But really what's happening here is people comment. And again, it ties into the culture for the senior management making these decisions of greenwashing and getting away from it. You think about this, if there's 12,000 people sharing that and the one person says, I don't see myself ever going back. And you think about if someone spent $100 a week at Whole Foods, the financial impact. Times are changing and the way people operate are changing and the way people get offended certainly are changing. So change is a constant in our world. And when I got into the recycling world, we actually had nine different streams we were separating and it would start off with white paper, colored paper, newspaper, clear glass, colored glass, and on and on and on. As markets grew and the demand was increased, it kind of gradually went down to the three. And this was maybe eight, nine years ago where three streams, pretty much that's what everybody was doing. One for trash, one for beverage containers, which was cans, glass, and plastic, and one for paper, which was, if you could rip it, you could recycle it. So you had those three streams. Then single stream commingling came in. People had to change, spend the money to go down to two. Some did, some didn't. But for the ones that went down to two, it was costly. Then it went to three. Now we're going to add in organics. Now we're going to four. The whole point here is it is changing. And what we have found is, well, if you know what's coming next, let's just go to Vegas and uh, put down a bet. But if you're, the culture is that you're not looking to spend money to deal with the change, that lack of spending, the cost is going to equal confusion, as we've all seen which results in increased contamination and further away from zero waste. And a perfect example of this, we've all seen products like this, you know, but I'll focus on the McDonald's cup because we've seen this before and I've asked people, what is this? And they don't well, say, well, it's a beverage container. Mm, maybe it's paper, could be compostable, maybe it's trash. The reality is, it's confusing and there's so many products out there that can be confusing, so you wanna keep it simple. A really clever trick that we created a couple of years ago was the I don't know bin. And this is a culture that's around, you know, continuous learning and improvement. Because one thing we have determined is that when people approach a recycling center and they have an item, they have two to three seconds to make that decision. This is not a life decision for them. So something like this for people who want to get involved can really make an impact. And how to do it is simple. Whatever you have for a bin, you can just add a separate bin and just inform custodial not to empty it. People take it out, identify it. They could even put those items on the front of the bin and then educate and pass it along. So it really is cool because the culture of your organization sets the stage and impacts all of the employees, the people that come in to visit, as well as all of the services involved in running that organization. But it goes a little step further on the bigger picture, and that is zero waste. There is a roadmap. Are you set up for success or failure? And what I mean by this is, as I said earlier, a lot of it is based around financials and money. 
And one of the greatest places to start is the hauler contracts where we've seen so many times opportunity to uh, claw back some money. And with that money gives you an opportunity to start because if there isn't any money, it leads to financial restrictions. And we all know what happens there. That results in poor planning with no time or money. And the poor planning, well, the outcome is pretty much a poor design, which leads into the wrong equipment, results in confusion, with the end result being high contamination, and then the custodial have to deal with it. Many times they want to do the right thing, but they just have not been set up for success. And what this leads me into, you know, a little humorous section on rogues and orphan that I've spoke about before. Remove the rogues. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen this in a place where we have rolled out, those are our containers over on the right. And as we walked through, there was another waste bin on the left. It was never picked up. And the culture there screams, it's not my job. And that's a problem and it creates twice as much work. And the next one, as we talk about orphans, we've seen this just, why is this happening? And the culture is basically the path of least resistance. I got to put it somewhere and it's closer, which just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't help out the end cause. And finally, there's the graveyard where the rogues and orphans go to die. And this was a world-class hospital facility in Toronto that we were working with. And the culture set here is, well, we're just not sure on the culture that's set here, but perhaps their culture was just by one size plastic bag that fits everything. So as I come towards the end of this presentation, it's been said the culture we live in, recycling is like boating. Most people don't think that they can make a difference. There's definitely room for improvement right across the board, but let's leave on a positive note. And that is recycling is the gateway drug to sustainability and zero waste. And that is my belief, culture is the driver. So thank you very much for your time. And I hope I made sense and there was a few takeaways for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I think you got a lot of uh, applause from the audience on the I don't know bin. Uh, if you wanna stop your sharing, uh, we can, uh, Camille and Barbara can get set up. Um, but don't leave the stage yet. I've got a question for you, uh, Bruce. What, um, what's the most common issue that impacts a successful recycling or zero waste program in your experience? Okay, well, aside from the very first point I talked about, you know, senior management not buying into a program or not earmarking any funds for it, the biggest issue I've ever seen is the custodial team. Because what I can clearly say is you can set all the time and money and energy in the world, but if you don't deal and educate and train the custodial staff, they can undo all of your hard work in one night because we consider them to be your last line of defense on zero waste because all good can be undone. So that would be my quick, quick takeaway or quick point on the most common issue. Great. Well, I think we'll have some more questions for you uh, after the other presentations today. So thank you. Terrific so much. Uh, Camille you. and Barbara. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, as Jill mentioned, my name is Camille Sawinski, and my company, BCK Programs, works directly with schools and school districts to shift behaviors towards sustainability, both at individual sites and at the district level. We do this by placing targeted environmental education programs in K through 12 classrooms. We're funded by and partner with cities and industries and local organizations to provide an age appropriate science background that explains the need for environmental best practices. Our outcomes, our outcomes always align with city strategies to comply with environmental policy and outreach goals. We guide students to implement best practices in real time. Often, as you know, they end up saving the school district money, especially when we're talking about zero waste. And while we cover topics from climate change to stormwater protection, lots of what we do centers around diverting landfill waste into other valuable waste streams or resource streams. <laughs> Unlike environmental outreach um, to school that's typical, our programs include sustained visits to classrooms over a lengthy period of time. We bring in industry experts 
and we don't leave until we make a solid systemic change. Okay, so today we're talking about changing cultures in the workplace. And you might be asking yourself, why are we talking about schools? Well, schools are not only a workplace for millions of children, they are also the biggest employer in many regions. In 2021, there were over 6.1 people employed in the public school system. Additionally, the changes that we make at school sites or the district level have a rippling effect in the community. We know students bring their best practices home to their parents because we get emails from their parents. <laughs> they tell us all about um, how their perspectives have changed when uh, we assign homework to the students. And um, some of their homework lessons are taking a deep dive into their, their waste containers to find out exactly what the percentage of waste and food waste and recyclables and recoverable food ends up in their trash cans. Uh, so this, this we know, we're changing the culture at school, but we're also changing other cultures, the community, the whole culture of the community, if you will. Okay. So talking about behavior shifts, and I think Bruce mentioned that waste diversion is a gateway <laughs> to other sustainability changes, changes, and he's correct. This is why we always start with uh, waste diversion at school sites. Like cool sites. Um, the shift in behavior for students and teachers and lunch staff and school administrators is not something that happens after watching a typical once in a once a year assembly about what you should do and where you should put things. Oh. The benefits of sustainability have to be hammered home over and over again and with the right message to the right targeted audience. And when students are the ones providing the real data about the makeup of their school waste and the folks who to and providing it directly to the folks who pay the waste hauling bills, we almost always can get support for systemic change. I'm gonna show you a short video of a district-wide culture shift or change that we made at one school district. And in this video, we're focusing on recycling milk cartons. The school district was sending well over 1 million milk cartons to the landfill every year. Most of their daily waste <laughs> was bags full of empty milk cartons, or in, in some cases, full milk cartons, which is even worse. Uh, they were also uh, creating a stormwater issue on campus because all the liquid that was remaining in the milk cartons was flowing out of the, the dumpster and um, causing a hazard in the street. We also do stormwater protection, and that's a big, a big red flag for us. Um, so I'm going to show you this video. Uh, there is no sound, but it should give you an idea of, you know, how it started, how it got, how it's going. <laughs> so in this this video from the mayhem of throwing everything in the trash can. Students are now emptying their milk out in the contain collection containers. Hopefully Bruce doesn't think those are uh, <laughs> too, too rogue, but um, then they're recycling the milk containers. Uh, we've since added food collection to that system right there. So they're, they're taking their uneaten food and they're putting it on a share table and they'll put their partially eaten food in a compost bin, and then we'll compost with them. So this is uh, this had to this had to shift a lot of behaviors. The custodian, the administration had to approve it. The principals had to be on board with it. The noon duty people had to be part of that, um, and the students, of course, are the ones that were doing it. Okay. So my team has been pretty successful in making these types of changes at school sites, but this success can be replicated by anybody really working in the school system. And I would venture to say even in a workplace with a little adjustment. Um, the secret sauce for us is that the changes must be implemented by and understood completely by the students. 
we have a basic recipe that we use and it's it's a uh, tongue in cheek up there for you to look at um, in all of our programming, whether it's stormwater education, energy conservation or waste diversion. Um, and we follow the recipe for all of our program and a lot of it mirrors what many professionals do. And if you're a consultant out there, you'll probably recognize the protocol. Our students always conduct comprehensive audits, right? Because you can't know what you're dealing with until you get a, a good look at it. And we, we also want to have benchmarks to measure our success or what, what more we need to do. Our students must always also analyze the collected data in the same way experts would. We want to know the reason for a high contamination rate, just like we want to know why a particular waste container on campus is either always overflowing or always empty. So kids have to dig into that data and understand why. Where is it placed? They need to do observations, all that stuff. The students must also put together a comprehensive report or presentation that includes their best practice recommendations. And they need to share this information with key stakeholders. Sometimes it's the principal, sometimes it's the school board, sometimes it's city council. Students are our best advocates for change. And we always tell everybody, it's really hard to say no to a student armed with information and also passion. Uh, and finally, the students need to implement, implement some of those best practices that the school board approves or the principal approves or whoever the, the decision maker is. They need to, just like you would do any type of scientific method, they need to try it out, see if it works, see what doesn't work, and then make improvements. Um, this is a picture of a comprehensive food waste audit that we did at a school and we yielded such alarming results that the school district ended up retooling some of the some of the things they thought were fan favorites which they later learned were not um we don't we um we ask them to do real work we don't just give them busy work so whatever they're doing has to come to a result and it has to be on par with what an expert would do and we have consultants behind the scenes of course in our company that guide them through that process and that's really the meat here um, the last ingredient, the real work, is what's most important. The work we elicit from students must be real. This slide shows a 10-page report that fourth graders completed in the National School District. They studied the makeup of their waste all year and compiled a list of what they thought the district should be doing in all 10 of their elementary schools. And they based their ideas on what they learned from their audits, and as well as hearing about best practices for other successful schools that diverted waste from their landfill. They presented their work to the school board and the school district agreed to implement the following, the following system changes. They implemented a carton recycling program. They placed one-to-one -one recycled waste stations all around the campuses. They eliminated plastic straws. They shifted away from spork and napkin packets to single dispenser units. Um, we began on-site composting at three school sites, and they finally agreed to allow us to do share tables and begin a food recovery program um, to get to find a place for some of that food that was going in the trash that was completely viable. We had a little bit of a small setback with COVID with this particular school district, but because we made the changes systemic, we're back on track and these changes are gonna go back into effect again now that we're hopefully, fingers crossed, in a little bit better place. And with that, I'd like to introduce Barbara Larson, who my team affectionately calls boots on the ground behind her back and to her face, because she spends every waking moment of her time on school campuses, making these behavior shifts and culture changes. Hey guys. So yeah, I'm proudly known as boots on the ground. And as my boots are walking through school sites, I constantly have my feelers out for anybody who has a shred of interest in sustainability, which usually the things I do, the kids want to do them with me. The students are interested and 
Um, and then that leads into their teachers and the noon duties who are around and the custodians and the leadership of the school. So um, I'm always, I have my fillers out trying to bring people in and always have sustainability part of the conversation. Um, through the work that we end up doing, um, most of the people that I engage with who may not have that much of a passion about diverting materials from the landfill, um, they end up seeing what the work that we do and seeing follow through with the um, changes that need to happen and want to be a part of creating systematic culture change at the school. So, you know, explaining the why of why we do something, um, luckily, you know, the kids all, you know, they can, I, when I compost with kids, I'm constantly saying like, why are we going to the trouble of doing this? And they can articulate that the, you know, the food waste causes methane and we're creating regenerative soils to grow food with. So that's a huge part of um, making that change and helping the, the kids really understand what it is, why we're doing it and seeing follow through with those resources they see that there's opportunity in those resources. So we always start with the waste audits, like um, Camille said, this is a waste audit that was brought on by a student at this high school, San Diego Academy. She just wanted to try to recycle something out of her lunch and she couldn't find a recycle bin. She had to walk all around campus looking. So that was a great jumping off point for us. Um, you know, people watching us do things like this, uh, they were, you know, they were like really impressed that all these teenagers felt that passionately about doing something to help their environment. And then we end up with incredible data that um, drives our change. And the, we make sure that the kids, the students, the teenagers in this case, get in front of the stakeholders. <clears throat> Um, and we get this amazing data. So at this school in particular, now we have organics recycling, which is super exciting. We're gonna be able to divert materials to an, or, an anaerobic digester. And uh, when you tell people, even custodians, that that food waste is now gonna be turned into fuel to fuel trucks, they're really actually intrigued and excited about it and willing to help uh, make that culture change happen. So this, you know, if you look closely, this is, uh, I think more than 80% is, would be, yeah, eight, well, it's 20% that's going to end up in the landfill. We could probably even find more. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost at 80% there. So that was a really impactful um, waste audit. And we had probably 200 kids helping to sort all of the waste into um, the resource piles. And we're really able to drive home like how to sort properly and um, then the, the viable opportunity with all of the waste streams. So that's really exciting, exciting for, for me particularly. Then we have the teens and the students bring that information to the stakeholders in their school communities. At this meeting in particular, we had the principal, we had the director of facilities, we had the director of nutritional services, and the students are presenting this information to them and making recommendations um, and being told, yes, 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 you can, you can, you can. So it's incredible and it's powerful. Um, and we have used the food waste, EPA's food waste hierarchy quite a bit to drive um, our actions. And because unfortunately, foods, uh, schools produce a ton of food waste. And so um, we have we, uh, been able to um, use the second, well, offer versus serve for sure has made a big difference. And then we've connected with some food, local food pantries in the area and devoted and have been bringing them, um, you know, hundreds of pounds, if not thousands of recovered food. So, and people are in the community, the school communities, they're very interested in making sure that this food doesn't go to waste when they know that it can help people. So follow through, seeing that those um, materials are super viable and have great opportunity otherwise, other than going to the landfill, is a huge part of creating culture change. Um, yeah, and so yes, we have do have that food recovery that's going. 
And it does make a big difference when people see that um, there's follow through and that something can something very useful can be done with the food waste. And, and then of course there's composting. So even though we have the anaerobic digester, uh, composting is still a fantastic thing to do and a wonderful jumping off point for so many different lessons and standards connections at schools. Um, and it brings um, children into nat the school gardens and the natural spaces on campus, which is super important to connect them with nature to make them care about it. So composting is the best. And um, we don't, we diverted 13,000 pounds of food scraps to composting last year in EUSD in nine schools. Um, so I think slide, I think that's, Yep. And um, that's our recipe. That's how we cook it up. That's how we serve it. And uh, we love what we do. And um, the children are all a huge part of making that happen. So good luck to everybody. Great. Thank you, Barbara and Camille. If you could stop sharing your screen so that Daniel can start bringing his up. And while he's doing that, of course, the, the biggest question that we have, and then we'll get to the other ones after the presentations, but how does how does somebody uh, introduce this to their, to their school district? Right, so like I mentioned, we are funded um, in large part by cities. So what we do is if you contact us at BCK programs, we go out and do the research to see if your city has a grant or some type of funding source. And then we match, you, we match your school up with that source and um we get to work so best way contact us and we figure that part out great fantastic we've got more questions for you so we'll get to those after daniel's presentation daniel uh welcome you're up thank you uh so can everybody hear me okay yes okay so well i'm, I'm daniel i work with el cavante just to break the ice i'm a bit nervous so I hope this, this goes out well. Um, so how do we create a culture change for zero waste? And I wanna talk about how we can use e-tools to, to do so, to actually create that change. And the first thing that I wanna talk about is how to, um, and this tackles into a little bit of uh, behavior change management and to, to be able to change people's uh, behavior, we need to build the opportunity, and this tackles into the, the built environment. We need infrastructure, as Bruce was saying, we need bins and we need them as, uh, sorted out or, or, or put throughout the facilities. Uh, we need capacity and this means knowledge. We need how to do things, how to sort waste, but we also need, <clears throat> um, we also need how to, we also need to know how to actually uh, be more sustainable, how to reduce, how to reuse, and finally, uh, <clears throat> to when talking about the motivation, we we're, we mean the incentives. So you can have peer pressure as an incentive. You can also have legislation as an incentive or as a motivation, or you can have tax incentives. Um, so some are, let's say, positive and not some others are, are, are negative. So this creates a sustainable change in, in people. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So uh, the culture path is uh, when we're talking about beginners, uh, we, we need to work on the built environment, uh, as I was mentioning previously, set a baseline, a waste audit, surveys, sales, the built environment, then establish or, or set those stations of sorting programs, waste tracking, uh, composting facilities, uh, biodigesters, wh whatever it is, we need that infrastructure, those facilities to actually do the, the the work or to do those processes when we are at a later stage or more intermediate uh we focus on the knowledge and the capacities so when we're talking about corporate zero waste commitments and service agreements changing uh the structure of those for example i work with with companies like cisco or flex uh in in mexico and uh, where i'm based uh, mostly <clears throat> and changing those service agreements and establishing those processes and it, just having them set in place uh, is part of a huge change that can have a ripple effect into other areas or other categories. In that sense, uh, establishing SOPs as, as Bruce mentioned and, and it was mentioned earlier, establishing SOPs from different organizations uh, or within an organization 
to establish those processes. Uh, most of the times what we see is when we're trying to go to zero waste and we don't have established process because it's new, because it's never done before, uh, the way the zero waste focuses on it or it targets it, um, but it's done always looking to save, to create, uh, to be more efficient, to save money. And so uh, in that sense, that's what we want to do is, is have the knowledge and that capacity to, to be able to actually do that. Um, and so when it, it's more advanced, we have, like I said, the incentives and rewards. And so um, a typical example is working with companies, establishing those, those agreements for three years, six years, uh, longer term agreements uh, with this, throughout the supply chain with, with the vendors to actually make it a viable. Um, and, and there are many examples of how this, is, this, this happens. And obviously employees and, and the engagement uh, ramps up or, or, or is, is bigger once you have those set in place. And obviously, communication, promote and reward the zero waste efforts. Uh, one thing that I've been working on and I realized uh, after working with some colleges, again, and some companies, is that it comes to a point where we want to take it outside the facilities. Uh, but that only happens when you're at an 80% or, or higher. One of the typical, some of the typical, sorry, challenges that we, we hear is, uh, and this addresses to the things I was mentioning before, lack of knowledge and awareness, resources, just the status quo, resistance to change. And, and I, I really like the examples that they were mentioning about the janitorial or the custodial staff, but because that happens in my experience in schools, in companies, pretty much everywhere, because they are the ones that are, are actually doing the work. So <clears throat> there's a resistance to change because we're humans, uh, but also when there's a lack of knowledge and it's not that people don't want to, it's that they don't see a clear path. Uh, and, and a lot of the times when, when the company and the decision makers, they, they stop on the cost, how much it's going to cost. And there's this fixed idea that, uh, and, and it's partially true, to be honest, that being zero waste is going to be more costly. And it's so, it, it is so, especially in the beginning of when implementing the zero waste programs, but in every, in every program that we do, and I've worked with the different clients, uh, is once we do the financial analysis, we see a clear um, payback and we see a clear return on investment uh, on those projects. So these are some of the typical challenges. Um, when, when it comes to the path, I, I like this graph because uh, either recycling or compost, depending on the facility or the, or the company that we're, we're tackling, it, you will have anywhere from zero to 50, 60, 70%. But then going up the ladder to reuse, reduce, and, and redesign, we, this is where it gets more complex, more complicated, and we need to focus more. But um, this has been, uh, I use this with my clients, and, and so it, it makes them understand better that once they have under control their recycling and the compost, they will need to... Uh, pick up their sleeves uh, and roll up their sleeves, sorry, and, and, and just get into a heavier uh, a work. So, And so when it comes to the e-tools that we're actually going to use, this is a typical waste tracker uh, that we use, that we have. I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with, with, with waste tracking uh, softwares and systems. There's a lot of that out there. So, <clears throat> but one thing that I see as a challenge is how do we convert that information that is typically handled by facilities or, or, or EHS departments? Uh, so how do we translate that into, thing, uh, into uh, a communication piece that it's available to everyone, to, to all the other uh, <clears throat> uh, members of the organization, customers, clients? And, and so that's, that's how the e-tools becomes more useful, more powerful. Uh, so companies can get their PR right, so they can do part of their branding uh, to communicate what they're actually doing. So we've seen that as a challenge. Uh, and so this is another way of presenting the same information. This is per waste stream, and this is just a, a visual aid of how, how to actually do that. Um, we also use eTools, and it's very much the same uh, software that we use, uh, uh, that we use internally. So we randomly select a couple of the stations that we have uh, at a site, 
and we we weigh what we have, what's contaminated and what's not. And so this, after having a baseline, uh, this helps to also figure and point out which stations, uh, or bin stations, are the most problematic, the ones that have the highest contamination rate. And so <clears throat> this e-tools helps us uh, like point fingers and, and giving that accountability to whichever department or area is near that, that station. That helps, uh, for example, in colleges, uh, CETIs where, where I was working, is it helped them uh, point fingers uh, to, to take that accountability to a specific area. And so we realized that there was something behind or, or bigger that they were missing the training. They, they had a lot of rotation from their employees. So a lot of the people were new. So that became um, a different strategy to tackle and to uh, garner or, or create a, a longer lasting change. Uh, so th that happened. Um, so another, another way of, of presenting the information, like I said, we, we do uh, ROI and financial analysis on most of the projects. But so another way of presenting the information is how to, <clears throat> for example, this are pretty much standard strate uh, strategies that an organization, whether it's a school or a company or a facility manufacturing has to do uh, at a point they will they will pretty much tackle biodegradable composting or have or have plastic ban uh, from food vendors. And so just having those percentages and grouping those strategies into the different to the clear categories or how they will add towards the zero waste goal, uh, it, it allows us to better understand and present information and also to do that those decisions. Um, and now we can prioritize. We don't have it here, but you can see, well, it makes more sense to start with the 49% of compostables and those projects. And so we tie that with the cost and, <clears throat> and the return on investment. And so it makes, it, it becomes easier to make those decisions. Uh, another, another aspect that we, we realize that helps a lot into the culture change uh, is establishing, and, and we have this pyramid and so when we want to tackle policies, then regulations and contracts, manuals, and I'm sorry, there's, there's a mistake here, but <clears throat> uh, so the last step, number four would be processes. So this is a ripple effect. So high, high level policies, regulations and contracts with service providers, vendors, uh, even customers, big customers, <clears throat> then um, the manuals is a very operating, very specific task and things how, and how to do those. And then the, the SOPs and other procedures. Uh, we also did a breakdown. Uh, part of our e-tools is to have a breakdown of how to, how to walk through uh, the implementation of, of, of these regulations or normativity. So we divided by two phases. So first we develop them, then we implement them. So when you're developing them, you review them, you modify, you approve, and then once you're implement, they're implemented, you promote them, you publish them, and then you only update. So um, one, one uh, experience that we had is, uh, sorry, and with, with a customer, and that's this is their, their dashboard, there was a list and you can see here, there are 15 uh, elements that had to be developed and then implemented. And so we have a status. And so what this helps us is keep track and, and be able to be more, uh, be able to uh, have more accountability. And so this also, it makes it easier to understand who's responsible, who owns what process uh, to change. So th this is what it allows us. And so finally, part of the, the, <clears throat> uh, the e-tools that we're working on is with some companies, after we achieved a high percentage of 80%, uh, we realized that they want to take this outside the facilities, outside the four walls of the, of the company. And, and we're working right now with piloting this program with school, with the school um, and, and with a company. And so we want to we came up with this platform that is a learning management system, also a zero waste home web app. Uh, and I'll talk, talk about that and the equipment. And so what we have on the learning management system is 
guidelines, videos, do-it-yourself videos uh, for people to employees and students to uh, adopt a zero waste at home uh, pro program. So from going from doing a zero waste audit at home to and sorting out the waste to doing compost or vermicompost. And, and so it de depends how, let's say, committed the employees are or how um, ambitious we want to be. And so this is tailored to uh, the, the different needs. And so this is the, the educational component, the, the learning component. Then when we have the, <clears throat> the, the tracking app, the zero waste app, this allows us to identify our carbon footprint to identify our waste, uh, so carbon tied to waste, uh, our, our waste footprint. And it, it, it generates information and it depends how uh, periodically or frequently we're, we're putting in information. But uh, for the specific project that we were doing with students is that they are inputting the information once a week, they sort out the waste, and then they, they weigh it, they input it. And so it gives you a, a, a data tracker. And for the school or the, or the company, we gather all the data and we present it in reports or we have an API and they can use it. And more than talking about how good our platform is, what I, what I wanna say is, or what I wanna transmit is that sustainability and zero waste we have a challenge of converting it to easy to digest, easy to understand, like little uh, beats and pieces. And, and how do we adopt them and to adapt them to uh, our everyday life? So those are the biggest challenges and that's what we're trying to tackle with, with uh, here. So this is very much how you would see the platform. And this is where you input the weight and the, and the different waste streams. You, you can see here a uh, different there are 10 categories, but this is also tailored. Uh, if you want to do less or more, it's, it's, it's up to the organization, up to the company or the school or the school teacher. Uh, and so this is just converting it to data that people can relate to, understand like tons of CO2 capture, like the carbon footprint, uh, five minute showers and, and, and the typical conversion. So let's create more impact and zero waste. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Camille and Barbara, if we could have you come back up on the stage as well. Uh, keep your questions coming in. Uh, Daniel, what, uh, what's, what's the next big thing that you're working on right now? So rolling the, the pilot program to, to uh, 500 more students in Argentina. Uh, th that's, th that's our, our next goal. And um, uh, launching a zero waste or a recycling center uh, for the city of, uh, for everyone in the city of Tijuana with a school. So the, the school will be, uh, will, will be inside their premises, will have a third party operating it, but it will service the whole city. Uh, and in Mexico, especially in Tijuana, we have a, a big lack of, uh, of uh, recycling centers or uh, MRFs. So th those are the two uh, things for, for me. Wow, fantastic. Camille, I saw you uh, chatting with some people <laughs> through the chat, way. but I wanted to give you some opportunity to address things uh, with our total audience. Can you, and Daniel, maybe you have something to add as well. Uh, the resistance about having you know students or employees involved in waste sorts and safety and other factors there. Um, where have you had some success addressing some of those concerns? Well, I'll speak personally from my experience um, because we've done quite a few waste audits at quite a few schools um, across Southern California and San Diego area. And I haven't reached, um, I haven't had the pushback that I've seen uh, mentioned in the comments. Um, even with COVID, I think because we do a pretty good job of like right now, all the students are masked who work together. But even before that, we always make sure the students are wearing gloves. They just can't participate without that. And we always give them grabbers to pick up items um, should they choose to. And then we also make sure that any student who is squeamish about it, you know, doesn't, doesn't participate. We don't force them to participate. Um, and I just really haven't had the major pushback, but I understand it, especially in our COVID times. 
Um, but I would say you would take the, you know, you would do precautions, right? Just like you would with anything. You would make sure that kids have non-latex gloves because some students do have, do have allergies and you would make sure at a minimum there's trash grabbers to separate into separate piles. And then of course we supervise, 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 which is probably the key. And anytime there's a something that is just a little too gross or a little too much, we step in and we help. Oh, that, that's my answer. I don't know how helpful it is to, to folks, but um, we do tend to do them a lot, the audits, so. Right. Daniel, anything to add on the safety of waste audits? So I, I would say that uh, not about safety, but getting getting part of the, the team of the company or the school staff, getting them involved is key. Uh, because more than the data or the fact they'll be there an hour or two just sorting out waste is is that awareness and that it, it to me it it takes their they they walk out of there with a sense of I'm responsible I can do I it's up to me I can do something so it, it, that and when it comes to the safety um, depends typically school waste is very I'll say friendly. Uh, I've done uh, waste audits where you would have like uh, sharper, uh, sharp uh, objects or, or so we would wear like um, other gloves, like uh, more protective, like the, I can't remember the word, but so for protection, uh, coveralls, we would use coveralls, depends on how dirty or how bad the, the, the waste is. So, so those are like, are the, my typical concerns. Um, and yeah, I guess I guess that's it. The, the one thing that's key is using the face mask, even before COVID, just because sometimes the smell is too bad. But uh, I mean, nothing. I wouldn't. Say, I would say that nothing too bad. It, it's uh, under control. Uh, I, I I tend to focus more on getting the people involved and getting decision makers or staff. And even I try to identify reticent people. And this works for schools and also for companies. If there's a way we can get a manager or someone that's not too keen into the zero waste theme, uh, we try to get them there, be part of the zero waste audit. Uh, they'll do a face or something, but uh, they'll participate. So that, that, that helps a lot. Great. Well, thank you. All of these presentations have been uh, really uh, um, interesting. Great to see uh, what is actually happening out there. And the, the key message, uh, I think what Bruce, Bruce led with is if you get the culture right, the rest of it falls behind, right? When you get your, your students, your staff, your employees, your leaders all engaged in wanting to solve the problem, uh, there's no end of the, the creativity and different solutions that can come into play. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to invite everyone to now leave this uh, Zoom meeting and return to the main Zoom session. Um, so again, that's the that's the link that you've been at throughout the day today. And thank you, uh, thank you. Jeremy. Just posted that in the the chat. Uh, be sure to bookmark that, and we will see you all over there. Thank you so much for all your presentations and participations. Thank you for doing this, Jill, for moderating. Thank you. Ciao.